Abuju mu kamarat. Aşi do beyse, o weti benuji. Abi de çok tam ben tapa yeri dan moron hem kasa. A can no tank to kitty. A uskovos mojan. Grevaso. Eee da provans de boba. Sa topret brusal. A je kona beyse plasla. He. Sa ni de bon temps pour un homme que faut travailler le voie. Voyage je casse, je casse tur. Est-ce que j'avais jamais songé pour un nouvel poste pour Vicky? Je vais donner à ce papier qui est que j'ai ramassé. Ça explique qu'il y a encore des bons terres là-bas qui peuvent y acheter en Amérique. Il y a vraiment des bons terres là-bas. Et ça arrive qu'on doit là 25 cents pour un arpent. Il y a vraiment, vraiment des arpents là-bas. C'est le plus que j'ai nommé le Wisconsin. Ah ben, comment est-ce que ça peut y aller ça? Ça va bien pour nous avoir un peu de l'un de l'un de l'un de l'un de l'un de l'un. Francois Petignot never looked back. In the months since his providential discovery of an advertising flyer, he was able to convince 13 families, totaling 81 Belgian souls, to give up most of their possessions and set sail for a better life. A life free of impossible land ownership, constant food shortages, and crushing poverty. It had been agonizing weeks of discussions and decisions, followed by tearful goodbyes with parents and cousins and friends and neighbors. When the ship Quinnebog set sail on May 13, 1853, on it rode the hopes and dreams and futures of what would become almost 10,000 Belgian pioneers. The name of the ship was the Quinnebog, and they knew they were going to Wisconsin, but that's really all they knew. They, they met Dutch people who were also on the ship, and those people were going to Wisconsin too, and they, but they were going to Sheboygan. Well, since the Belgians didn't know anything about the state and the various groups that, had, that were living here already, um, they decided to go to Sheboygan with this, these Dutch people. But when they got to Sheboygan, it was German-speaking. And here were these French-speaking Walloons from, from Belgium, didn't understand the language, and most of the good land was already taken. So they were told that there were French-speaking Canadians in Green Bay. They decided that that's where they'd have to go then. So they, I think for the most part, they walked from Sheboygan to, to Green Bay. The land they finally chose was located about 20 miles northeast of the Green Bay settlement. They built rough shelters, it was told, of um, branches and twigs built in an inverted V. They would dig wells in the swamps and try and twigs and branches were their um, beds. And that's the way they were until the menfolk uh, cut enough trees down in order to start building a small log cabin. They chinked it with mud and they had to call this home. The first years were hard and then there was a cholera epidemic and so that that um, um, put a, an ebb on the, on the um, immigration for a while. But because the, the letters didn't get back and forth to Belgium very fast, um, the number of people that came just kept increasing. So there were upwards of eight to 10,000 Belgians that left their country within a, an eight year time period. An imperfect triangle, approximately 15 miles on a side, with corners near Red Banks on the southwest, Casco in the southeast, and Little Sturgeon to the north. The land covered about 100 square miles in parts of Door, Kiwani, and Brown counties. This was, and is, the Wisconsin Belgian Settlement, the largest rural Belgian settlement in the entire United States. The, the forested land was a, uh, an, an obstacle to farming, 
and the typical sequence would be to, to clear some land, to burn the trees, burn out the stumps, uh, use it for pasture, uh, eventually clearing a little bit more land, that being used for pasture and the previous cleared land then put into crops. So it was a, a very slow process and one that uh, took an extraordinary amount of time to uh, achieve. And yet, very slowly, the community of families, isolated deep in the wilderness, began to tame the land. The strength and persistence of the Belgian immigrant were able to overcome the harshest adversities. But when you look close, especially at the faces of the Belgian women, you see the true price of the toil. The women worked on the farm, in the farms uh, on, with their husbands, um, but they had to take care of the children and cook the meals for the, for the family. Uh, they, um, they made the clothes. Uh, men made wooden shoes, but, um, but the women made the clothing and, and uh, carried the vegetables to market and ro carried the wheat on the, in bushel baskets on their heads from, the, from the, the farm to the mill where, they had, where it was ground into flour, and then they had to carry it back home again. Little by little, the Belgian community created a better life for themselves. In less than 20 years, forest paths would become wagon trails. Additional income would come from shingles produced by the families from the native trees. In 1868 alone, over 4 million shingles would be shipped from just the Brussels area. This income would allow the Belgians to improve their homes and buildings and allow the erection of local schools and churches. Certainly the early days of grubbing out a mere sustenance were ending. Until the evening of Sunday, October 8, 1871. They had been battling the fires that whole summer of 1871. Now these fires were starting spontaneously all over because of the dryness. It hadn't um, rained for many, many, many months. But this one was different. It started off very slowly and then suddenly a huge wind came up and it ignited all the smaller fires and made it into one large fire and it came upon the whole Belgian community in a sudden conflagration of wind and fire. In a single evening, 200 people killed. 5,000 people instantly made homeless. Nearly every home and building in the Belgian settlement destroyed. The fire was devastating for, this, for these people after having been here um, well, what, six, three, eleven, eighteen years, and they lost all all their farm buildings. They lost m much of their their cattle, and their land was was burned, so their crops were gone. And um, many people lost their lives. It was it was difficult on both sides of the bay. In nature, after a forest fire, what springs up from the blackened earth can be something altogether new and delightful. In the case of the Belgian community, that would be the new brick-faced houses that dominate the region to this day.
church was very important. We never missed mass unless you were sick. In the Belgian community, the first two-thirds of the 20th century were all about maintaining traditions. And, as always, at the center was the church. You never miss mass. Um, it was just a part of your religion. You didn't question it. You just went along with what, what was taught you from your ancestors. They built little chapels, which were all uh, around the countryside, which you still see today. These little chapels were usually designated to a particular saint. Well, I think for the, you know, certainly the, the older generations, they were uh, deeply religious people, um, hardworking, taking pride in, in their homes and community. Uh, yeah. They enjoyed themselves, they worked hard, but they, they enjoyed each other's company, a good game of cards, uh, uh, you know, a stop in the local tavern next to the church after, after Mass. Uh, I think just about every little church around has a bar close by that, uh, that they enjoyed a social gathering. Fun for the Belgians around here would probably be going to a kermis or, or playing a game of cards called Kuya, drinking beer, uh, having some, some Belgian pie. The kermis literally means church mass. It was a celebration of the harvest. Much as we celebrate Thanksgiving, they celebrate the kermis. Each little community had its own kermis. The priest would say the mass, the people would file out of church and would be met by a brass band. Then they would proceed to go to the tavern. And there they ate, drank, and were merry for many an hour. Um, there were pies, Belgian pies. There were prune and apple and raisin and rice, um, many different varieties. Uh, in the old days, they also had um, contests of wrestling down a grease pig or climbing up a grease pole. But it was, besides that, it was a gathering of your relation, a gathering of people that you loved and that shared your common bond. And you would have a meal and you would celebrate the fact that you had survived another year. Ask any Belgian about Belgian food, and the answers you get back are very passionate. It was just a time to get together, and they drank beer, ate booyah, you know, trip and jut and cassette and uh, head cheese and whatever else, you know, they made, you know, pig's feet. Lots of pork, lots of beef, lots of poultry, an awful lot of bakery. You know, it was during special occasions that the, uh, my grandmother and my mother and my aunts and, and uh, cousins or whatever would make the Belgian pies and they'd make, you know, 100, 150 Belgian pies at a time and every, every place in the house, you know, every table, every counter, every couch, every chair was, had a Belgian pie on it, you know, so you couldn't sit down but it, it sure smelled good, so. Man, that's, that's as good as it gets, I can sit down and, and the Belgian pies aren't, aren't real big, they're probably maybe 8, 10 inches in diameter but uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be unheard of me sitting down and finishing off a pile by myself. <laughs> Fully 100 years after the Great Fire of 1871, the most amazing aspect of the Belgian settlement was that it was all still completely intact. The uh, research that I did in the 70s indicated that of the population, 80% of the population within that area on the farm of, of farm population was of Belgian descent. That is incredibly high statistic. 80% within that area. You don't get figures like that unless you're looking at, at perhaps a, a very close-knit conservative uh, religious group like the Hutterites or Mennonites or Amish or perhaps a Native American reservation you get figures like that but uh, as, a, as an ethnic island that's really quite remarkable. I had 40 some first cousins just on my mother's side and we'd get together every Christmas, every Easter, uh, every time there's a wedding we still get together for a family picnic and it's big enough to almost be the size of a whole community 
gathering. So, you know, we still have close family ties. You know, that was one thing that I didn't like. Uh, I still brag about being full-blooded Belgian once in a while. They spoke to Walloon together all the time, my parents and grandparents. And being the oldest one in the family, when I started grade school, I couldn't speak a doggone word of English. But every time he'd go any place, church or family get-togethers, all the older people spoke Belgian, and we didn't understand a word they said. You know, we, we picked up a few words, but they weren't exactly the, great, the, the best words to be repeating. You know, I mean, everybody spoke Belgian. I mean, even the cows wouldn't move unless you swore at them in Belgian. Belgians are generally known as stubborn, penny-pinching. <laughs> hang on to their money, <laughs> but they're kind-hearted, they're good souls, they'll help anybody. It's character that we have to look at, and, and certainly a work ethic that is second to none, and hard-working, and not only the work ethic, but the reliance on, on craftsmanship and high-quality work is uh, a characteristic that I would identify. 10,000 Belgian immigrants in less than 10 years settled about 100 square miles of American wilderness, clearing the land, raising large families, praising their Lord for the gift of a new life. Through backbreaking labor, through disease, drought, and then destruction by fire, carrying on the traditions of their ancestors for over 150 years and beyond. These are the people of the Wisconsin Belgian settlement. The fact that they came over with nothing and uh, made nothing into something and had land and property and they um, weathered so many hardships. I'm proud to be a Belgian because they've overcome so much. They've had hard times and they've managed to, to get through them and still go on and, and make something of themselves. We are full-blooded Belgian and we are proud of our heritage and where our ancestors came from and their work ethics and their values that they passed on to us and that, that's something to be very proud of. Proud of the traditions, uh, the, the family values we hold, the religious values we hold, uh, the fact that, you know, we've lived in this community for, you know, almost 150 years, uh, made it a, a good place to live good place to raise a family we did fine and you know like I said you don't have to be rich in life you just have to be happy and satisfied with what you have you know and we are